This video is aimed at those that have played and are familiar with most of the Mario RPGs, or at least one of the earliest and one of the latest. Now, I am going to do a lot of summarizing of things you already know, but it's all for the sake of pinpointing individual facets of the series' decline in writing quality, so bear with me. Please also note that my channel focuses much more on writing in games than on mechanics. There are a plethora of channels out there which focus on gameplay, so if you want a more traditional review or insight into a game's meta, then you are not going to find those things here. Please do not barrage me in the comments about how I didn't go in-depth into gameplay. It is not my intention to do so. Additionally, for context, I originally wrote the bulk of this script shortly after the release of Paper Jam, and have pretty much been sitting on it these past few years, which is why I don't have a section dissecting Color Splash at all. I think we can all agree, though, that 99% of what I'm going to say about Sticker Star can ultimately be applied to Color Splash as well. And of course, we now live in a post-Superstar Saga and Bowser's Inside Story remake world, but again, most of the good elements those games have are inherited from their original incarnations, so I will not be discussing them separately. I will, however, take a look at Bowser's Minions and Bowser Jr.'s Journey, and you will find that I actually have a surprisingly positive opinion of those two mini-campaigns. Now then, on to the video proper! A while back, I made a video detailing my analysis of an unfortunate trend in the decline of writing quality in the recent Kingdom Hearts games. I am an enormous fan of that series, and it kills me to see what's happening to its narrative quality. However, I am also a rather passionate fan of the handheld Mario and Luigi RPG series, as well as the Paper Mario series, and unfortunately, I've noticed a very similar trend with those franchises as well. I realize that the sharp decline from Thousand Year Door onward and from Dream Team to Paper Jam have been discussed to death, this is not lost on me, but I still think I have some worthwhile insights to contribute to the conversation, so please hear me out. Now to clarify, I'm not talking about raw gameplay. All these games are phenomenally fun, and their battle systems are engaging and addictive, and I know that video games are about gameplay first, but look at it this way. Pick your favorite Final Fantasy game. Better yet, pick any game in the Tales series. Now take that game's battle system and completely remove the story. Remove any plot or character development, any semblance of intrigue, and replace it with the blandest, most uninspired, cliché, predictable, standard, A to B type plot you can possibly think of, but maintain the game's length. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mario & Luigi Paper Jam. You see, we're still talking about an RPG here, so story is still an undeniably significant part of the overall experience, Mario or not. And think back to the game that popularized the Mario RPG series is in the first place. Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. Now, full disclosure, I haven't actually played that one yet. It's in my backlog, I'm just waiting for Virtual Console to come to the Switch, but I did my research. It has a plot. It has original, interesting characters and a set of villains very unique and unusual to the Mushroom Kingdom. It allows you to put Bowser and Peach in your party at the same time and fight alongside them. That is a recipe for epic storytelling in the Mario universe in and of itself, and that wasn't even all the game had going for it. It is also my understanding that fans of Seven Stars were just as infatuated with the two original party members, Mallow and particularly Gino, who was so popular among fans that he even got a Mii costume in Smash 4 and continues to be clamored for as a DLC fighter in Ultimate. Of course, this game was the progenitor of the two series that it ultimately branched off into, the Mario and Luigi RPG series and the Paper Mario series. So let's look at what Seven Stars established and how much of that got carried over to the initial outings of its offspring. Seven Stars established a trend of turn-based battle systems that demand your constant attention by allowing you to power up your own attacks and lessen or even negate damage from enemy attacks by utilizing timed button presses, otherwise known as timed hits or action commands. It established a system of overworld exploration also more engaging than your typical RPG by maintaining some very light but appropriate platforming. It established a concept of taking Mario to very diverse settings, many if not most of which would not normally be found in a more traditional Mario title. And of course, it established a precedent of story and character-driven gameplay that just so happens to star the plumber and take place in his universe. Both Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga and the original Paper Mario adopted all of these ideas and expanded on them to boot. I would argue that some of the more awkward precision platforming of Seven Stars was replaced with various moves and tools that could be used in the field to interact with the world in a more interesting adventure game style, 
while the most basic of jumps and such were kept around just to give the titles that extra little shot of authentic Mario flavor and lend the environment some verticality. Other than that, everything is kept more or less intact, with the exception of the party systems. Paper Mario had an unforgettable cast of original characters, both hero and villain. All of your party members are creatures native to the Mario universe, but they all have a unique name, look, personality, outfit, and skill set to bring to the table. They are fun and different to use, and they all have something to say about what's going on around them. Also, like Mario, they have gameplay applications in both the field and in battle. Like Seven Stars, the story does revolve around collecting a certain number of enchanted MacGuffins, but both of these quests have a very episodic feel that's full of flavor. From here on out, I will refer to these episodic plot arcs as scenarios. Each scenario offers up a new and intriguing location, an area that's visually distinct, both from the other areas in the game, as well as from the overall Mario universe. Additionally, they offer a new party member and a new boss character, sometimes even someone you get a glimpse of well before the actual fight allowing you to get to know them and their quirky personality before they are removed from the equation. And to further mix things up from a storytelling perspective, there is an interlude between each chapter in which the player takes control of Peach in captivity and stumbles upon some intrigue about Bowser's plan and passes on this information to Mario, or at least has some humorous interaction with her captor. All of this simply serves to tell what could have been a very straightforward by-the-numbers rescue quest in a more interesting fashion. Not just humorous, but genuinely engaging, and there is an important difference, though Nintendo does not seem to think so. You see, a few jokes will make you chuckle, but they will not carry you through an experience on their own. Watching some enemies bicker or hearing some random NPC make a surprisingly shrewd or sassy comment is cute, but it's not going to keep anyone playing if they know they're still just bound for grassland, beach, desert, icy mountain, volcano at the end of the day, without a single interesting twist or turn in the story. Mario RPGs are renowned for their humorous writing, but that humor is worthless if the context isn't even remotely interesting. Look at the brainwashed Hammer Bros in Partners in Time. Their crappy early 2000s lead speak is absolutely hysterical, but it's the context that really makes that such a memorable and enjoyable moment. These aren't a couple of generic toads speaking that way for no reason other than to get a cheap laugh out of the player. They're Mushroom Kingdom natives who are clearly having their brains scrambled by the alien-made mind control helmets that have been forcibly strapped onto their heads. The implication here is that this is how the shrooms think we speak, or maybe even that that's how they speak, and their speech patterns are being directly translated into English. There's a great juxtaposition of humor and horror in that the brainwashing the Hammer Bros are being put through is pretty screwed up when you think about it, but the way it's causing them to speak is friggin' hilarious, and contrasts nicely with the relatively grave situation they've found themselves in. But I'm getting ahead of myself. For now, let's look at Superstar Saga. Like Paper Mario, it carries over pretty much every element that made Seven Stars distinct and special, but it took a different route with regard to party members. Instead of recruiting an assortment of colorful Mushroom Kingdom denizens, the only two party members you have for the whole game are Mario and, uh, what's his name? Greenstash. But despite sounding fundamentally worse than Paper Mario's party system on, well, paper, this still works surprisingly well. You see, in Paper Mario, your party members are essentially sidekicks. Their special moves are performed independently of Mario, and Mario himself is a sort of MVP in battles in that if a partner gets KO'd, the fight can continue, but if Mario gets KO'd, it won't. But although Mario's name will always come first in the Mario and Luigi titles, Luigi is more of a partner to Mario, an equal. They level up their stats the same way, but more importantly, they perform all their special attacks and most of their field maneuvers together. One can't really make it without the other. Losing one bro in battle doesn't just lock away all your special moves, it outright cripples the remaining brother by forcing them to drag the fallen one along while evading enemy attacks. It's actually genius design. And as an added bonus, it also serves to highlight the bond between the bros. Yes, there are other titles in which you can play as Mario and Luigi together, but only in the Mario and Luigi series is that relationship such a fundamental part of both the core gameplay and the narrative. The only other place it's as touching from a narrative standpoint is in the Luigi's Mansion games. And let's not forget about the characters and scenarios. Like Seven Stars and Paper Mario before it, Superstar Saga also features a cast of original and beloved characters, <coughs> <Fawful>. <coughs> as well as a somewhat episodically driven story. 
However, I posit that Superstar Saga actually shakes up the narrative structure even more than its predecessors by focusing more on larger plot arcs than a MacGuffin collection quest, though that does admittedly find its way in eventually. The way I see it, Superstar Saga's plot can be divided into three major arcs. The first is, of course, the initial hunt for Cacletta, who has stolen Peach's voice for dubious purposes. This arc alone has more intrigue and twists than the entirety of both Dream Team and Paper Jam combined, by the way, with elements such as taking place outside the Mushroom Kingdom, Bowser agreeing to help get Peach's voice back, losing his memories and becoming Popple's sidekick rookie, Cacletta transforming Bean Bean Kingdom royalty Prince Peasley and Queen Bean into monsters, learning why Cacletta wanted Peach's voice of all things in the first place, and ending in her initial defeat at the revelation that Prince Peasley and Princess Peach knew of Cacletta's plan ahead of time and actually tricked her into taking Birdo's voice. It's also worth noting that even the way Luigi ends up joining Mario for the adventure is humorous, as it was the result of a mix-up in Waving Goodbye to Mario, where he accidentally gets drafted into Bowser's army. The second plot arc is the shortest, but also the most unusual choice. I call it the Vacation Arc. What I love about this arc is that following the defeat of Cacletta, which could easily have simply ended the game, disregarding length of course, the story just sort of continues in an aimless but charming meander. With her voice back, Peach flies down to the Bean Bean Kingdom to join the bros on a hard-earned vacation. And you just sort of hang out with Peach and do that, until the third arc begins. The third and final arc is of course the Bowletta chapter. This portion of the story is probably the most formulaically predictable, with the kidnapping of Peach and collection of Beanstar pieces, but the idea of Cacletta's soul possessing Bowser's body was still incredibly novel at the time, as no other villain had ever used and abused Bowser like this, and there are plenty of other small adventures and scenarios to be had leading up to the final showdown with her. Heck, you actually rescue Peach a couple hours before you defeat Bowletta. Furthermore, players are treated to the return of the Koopalings, which was a much bigger deal at the time, as this was long before the Big End started sticking them into every single platformer and spin-off game. Okay, so we've established that Paper Mario and Superstar Saga evolved the concepts and mechanics laid down by Seven Stars, while still remaining totally true to their source material, and most importantly, not completely missing the point in any of the areas they emulated. However, mutation and degradation are a gradual process. Those starting games are both phenomenal. But how did their sequels fare? Actually, great. Paper Mario's second installment, The Thousand Year Door, was pretty much a case of if it ain't broke, pump it full of steroids. It was the same, but bigger and better in every way. Obviously, it was a huge graphical improvement, but everything from the world design to the battle system was expanded. New party members were recruited, all brilliant and charming original characters, and arguably more importantly, some very charismatic new enemies were added. Taking the role of main antagonist from Bowser, we were introduced to the x noughts who were hilarious in their own right, while still being legitimately dangerous. And this is also a point I want to highlight, as it will become important later. It doesn't matter how funny your main antagonist is if they're not dangerous. In fact, if you have to choose just one of the two, then make them dangerous. The reason the humorous dialogue coming out of Lord Crump is so effective is because he's still a powerful adversary, and a problem for whatever locals he's abusing. If we don't see the antagonists antagonizing anyone other than Mario and Peach, it feels more like a family feud than a quest to save the world. And the x noughts role as the new primary antagonists opened the door to a new role for our beloved Koopa King in the story. Thousand Year Door, you see, adds a second part to each Between Chapter interlude. First, we take control of Peach and explore the x Moon Moonbase, which is a wonderfully interesting location. And then after that, we are given control of Bowser, who is hilariously trying to be the bad guy, but is always about two chapters behind Mario and the x noughts Seeing Bowser reduced to a completely ineffectual comic relief character totally works, though, because of the context. We've already seen him steal the Star Rod and be the big bad. And just because he has no freaking clue what he's doing in Thousand Year Door doesn't mean that he isn't potentially dangerous. He is still encountered by Mario for two boss fights over the course of the game, the second of which is quite possibly my favorite fight with him in the history of Mario games, simply because of the context. Bowser has no idea what's going on. He's been two steps behind Mario the whole game. By all rights, he really has nothing to do with the story. He just insists on inserting himself into it because he's Bowser. And then, after a grueling fight with the actual primary antagonist, Grotus, and no chance for Mario to heal or save, he accidentally falls through the ceiling, 
presumably just because he's an out of shape fat ass, and just so happens to land right on top of Grotus and in front of Mario. So of course he proceeds to challenge you to a battle. He's the penultimate boss of a game that he really had almost nothing to do with, but it's such a perfectly scripted moment that I adore it. I think it's the only time I ever genuinely laughed out loud in a room by myself right before a boss fight, of all things. And of course, the scenarios are varied and inspired, with the humorous dialogue layered on top of genuinely exciting setups. The first chapter has a classic medieval castle and dragon premise, which is unusual for a Mario game. Then you go to an enchanted woods, slowly being mechanized by the X-Nauts, then a modern gladiatorial arena where you investigate a mystery as you're climbing the ranks, a haunted village where people are being turned into pigs and you eventually get your body stolen by a doppelganger, then you get stranded on a deserted island for a pirate-themed adventure, then get mixed up in a mystery on a luxury train, and so on and so forth. All these places look extremely unique and have a compelling story to tell with a wonderful cast of original characters to tell it. Forgive me if I sound like a broken record, but these details are key to the decline of the coming games. Now for the sequel to Superstar Saga. I also felt that Partners in Time was almost, if not just as, strong as its predecessor, as well as pretty much the best use of the concept of the babies to date. Many people bash on this title because it's not truly open world like Superstar Saga was, but I personally am of the notion that even in an RPG, an open world for its own sake is not necessarily a good thing if done poorly, as I believe it was in Bowser's Inside Story, but more on that in a bit. Side note, here's an example. I love A Link Between Worlds. You love A Link Between Worlds. Everybody loves that game. It's great, blah, blah, blah. However, I would not say that it's my personal favorite top-down Zelda game for one simple reason. The story. The inherent problem with making an almost totally non-linear game is that the plot isn't given much room to develop in interesting ways, because the game has to account for players doing what they want when they want. Yes, freedom is fun, but I personally will happily trade that for sequence if I'm given an intriguing tale to follow along that route. It is for that reason that I am rather partial to Minish Cap, because the world is still open enough that you can side quest it up as you please, but the dungeon and scenario order is fixed so that they can tell you a tale with twists and turns, rather than a non-linear story with only about two or three big beats, like A Link Between Worlds does. Now granted, we're talking about Zelda games, and I'm not saying that Minish Cap was a masterfully written, unpredictable roller coaster ride, but we do learn more about Vati as the game progresses, and get to watch the relationship between Link and Ezlo grow, as well as power up your Picori Blade to create the Four Sword over the course of the journey. What do we know about Yuga at the end of A Link Between Worlds? Pretty much nothing. Side rant over. But let's look at Partners in Time mechanically real quick. Again, like Thousand Year Door, it's mostly just an expansion of its predecessor. It doesn't just stack new things on top of old things, however, as some abilities, such as hand powers, are replaced with baby-based abilities. It loses a tiny something in exchange for its new material, but for what it's worth, I think that it serves to freshen the experience while still totally validating the previous entry, giving both an equal amount of replay value rather than just outdating the earlier title. And yet because Partners in Time is still mechanically the same as Superstar Saga, no one can accuse it of changing course too drastically. It's actually a very interesting way to handle a sequel, I think. But the scenario writing is one place where I think Partners in Time really shines. Not just in spite of, but perhaps even because of its more linear nature. You see, this entry introduces another original primary antagonist, not unlike the X-Nauts in Thousand Year Door. But whereas the x knots were more akin to a cult, the Shroobs are really an invading armada of creepy and very foreign-seeming aliens. Their leader, the Princess Shroob, isn't as charismatic as Cacletta or Fawful, though she's certainly not devoid of charisma entirely, but as a race of stock enemies, the Shroobs leave their mark, quite literally, in just as engaging a manner. And this is a major point that I believe makes for good scenario writing and environmental design making the presence of the villains visually apparent even when they're not on screen. In Superstar Saga, there are a few scenarios which always stick out in my mind as being particularly well done. The first time you arrive at the Bean Bean Castle Town and the Woohoo University sequence where you first defeat Cacletta. Why? Because these two parts have something very important in common. The locations themselves are devastated. Cacletta came to town and tore shit up. This reinforces what a heinous bitch she really is underneath the amusing verbal tics and manic cackling. She didn't just steal Peach's voice, she's raining destruction wherever she goes. 
Same goes for Woohoo University. It was supposed to be like a genius science academy, but Cacleta came, wrecked the place, and converted the entire student and faculty body into horrible mutant monstrosities. That's pretty fucked up, but it also serves to make her humorous dialogue pop more. So it is with the shrews. Granted, they're not really funny, per se. In fact, they don't even speak the same language as the denizens of the Mushroom Kingdom. But this makes sense. And like I said before, if you have to choose between funny and threatening for your antagonist to be compelling, make them threatening. And the shrubs are certainly threatening. They completely overwhelm the Toad race, and even young Prince Bowser and his armada, in terms of technology and military might forcing the heroes to work with Bowser at certain junctures. And let's face it, Mario and Bowser teaming up is always fun to see in the RPGs. But even beyond this, what I absolutely love about the Shroobs is the immediately noticeable impact their presence has on the environment everywhere that they go. Toadwood Forest is filled with their creepy purple mushrooms, innocent toads melded into the trees, and the pollution from their Vim factory. The snowy village from the opening chapter is in shambles. Yoshi's Island is covered in the massive footprints of the titanic Yube, who is slowly trying to make the Yoshi population extinct. Toad Town is a post-apocalyptic wreck, and don't even get me started on their redecorating plan for Peach's Castle. The point is, even without proper dialogue, the Shroobs have plenty of personality. We see them laugh sadistically on many occasions, and they are undeniably dangerous. Forget Peach! They need to be stopped because of all the innocent toads they're slaughtering War of the World style. And this is why I don't care at all that the game isn't as open world as Superstar Saga. I don't need to spend time trekking the interconnecting areas. The places I end up through the time holes are brimming with personality and devastation. The destinations themselves bring the world to life in a very meaningful way and constantly remind the player of the importance of their quest. So now we come to another common element between the Paper Mario series and the Mario & Luigi series, the third game. In each of these franchises, the third game represents a turning point. In my personal opinion, these third installments are actually both still quite good, but they alter their respective series' trajectory toward lesser quality in the titles to follow. Let's start with Super Paper Mario. It completely did away with the mechanics of the brilliant previous two installments. Pretty much just tossed them out the window. This was not a good idea. Gone are the turn-based battles, interesting party members, and even remotely decent character design for the filler NPCs, replaced with the most unforgivably lazy designs I have ever seen in any entertainment medium. Gone are the unique badges and even interesting origami world layouts. These things have been replaced with a relatively basic 2D side-scroller where you jump on enemies. I think the only thing they kept, other than the character designs for the main cast, was the limited item inventory, of all things. However, there is a silver lining. Not all of the things that replaced the Paper Mario staples are bad or unfun. They're just not as good as what came before. This is a shame, because it colors the rest of what is mechanically a basic but reasonably fun experience in a bad light, but it is what it is. The partners are replaced with pixels, which do not look as interesting and have extremely one-dimensional personalities, not that it matters, as they never speak again after you first recruit them, but functionally they work in the new setting, giving you a bunch of extra abilities, attacks, and just ways to interact with enemies and the environment aside from just jumping. Combine this with the recruitment of three other playable characters, which happen to include the one and only Koopa King, always a good thing, and we're at least getting some consolation prizes for our lost sidekick comrades. It of course bears mentioning that this game's primary mechanic is the switching between 2D and 3D perspectives to solve puzzles and navigate the game world, and it works. I mean, it's fun and interesting, but it really did not need to be in a Paper Mario game. Do that stuff with New Super Mario Bros, which desperately needs a hook like that, and I will eat it up, but not here. Plus, Paper Mario himself always existed in a 3D world before, so locking him into 2D now is just plain inconsistent. Although, this adventure does take place in a literal alternate dimension, so interpret as you will. But here's what's not inconsistent. Super Paper Mario might lose sight of where it came from mechanically, but it completely holds on spiritually in the storytelling department. Nintendo still build it as something of an RPG, and for my money, it does quite alright with character arcs and plot twists. First off, there is actually a story to be told. Sounds painfully obvious, but just wait till the next installment. That ball gets dropped fast and hard. Once again, Mario and company are faced with a new enemy, somebody who makes Bowser look like Dennis the Menace by comparison. 
Count Black is out to destroy not just his world, not just the world next door, but all worlds, all dimensions. And he has a motley crew of equally quirky and lovable henchmen with a loyalty so undying it becomes downright touching by the story's end. And really, that story has everything. For one, it has fun and varied scenarios taking you through ancient ruins, a trap-filled manor, outer space, an alternate prehistory where plants became the dominant species, and the underworld, because Mario literally dies at some point in the story. It has some visible devastation of the locales you visit, at least in the form of that ominous purple-black void floating in the distance, which gets closer and larger with every world you complete. Not to mention the one world that you actually get to see the void engulf and decimate. It also manages to have a few of those famous Paper Mario between chapter interims, which follow a character outside of Mario's current party exploring the enemy layer. Finally, it has a primary antagonist who opens the game by forcibly marrying Peach and Bowser, and yet he undergoes more character development than arguably anyone in Mario RPG history, as he's having second thoughts about his own plans even before Mario makes it to his lair, and ends up helping you defeat the true final boss in the end. And of course, it also has Mr. L, who's not just a brilliant, hysterical, and thoroughly unpredictable character, by which I mean who could have predicted such a character would ever even exist, but he took Luigi, the character I was by far the least excited to recruit going into the game, and made me the most excited to recruit when I finally got him. Paper or not, the fact that he's not a skin for Luigi in Smash Bros is downright criminal. And the real kicker here for me is I've actually played this installment the most individual times out of any Paper Mario. That's not because I think it's the best one, and it isn't. I still prefer Thousand Year Door in just about every conceivable way. But because Super Paper Mario is more fast-paced in both moment-to-moment -moment gameplay and to get through in general, and I still really do enjoy the gameplay, characters, and story plenty, personally speaking, I find myself returning to it more than the game I prefer, ironically. But that's telling to what I think of it. It isn't what came before, and it isn't as good as what came before, but it's good enough. Because it at least held true to the spirit of its predecessors, I respect it and enjoy it for what it is. So switching gears back to the sister, or perhaps brother, series again. Bowser's Inside Story is the third installment of the Mario and Luigi franchise, and I sort of see it as a fulcrum for the series. I view this game line as a sort of Venn diagram of trilogies, by which I mean Trilogy 1 consists of Superstar Saga, Partners in Time, and Bowser's Inside Story, and Trilogy 2 consists of Bowser's Inside Story, Dream Team, and Paper Jam. The original trilogy and the Starlo trilogy, if you will. Spoiler alert, I like the original trilogy much more. Now, Bowser's Inside Story is widely considered to be the fan favorite from what I tend to see online, and I can see why, but I don't quite agree. On paper, this entry is easily the strongest, especially for someone like me who wets his pants anytime you say Bowser is playable. The premise is Fawful, the fan-favorite evil sidekick to Cacletta, has returned from the original title and is now the primary antagonist. Would you like a side order with that humongous helping of fan service? Okay, Bowser is playable for about 50% of the game. Fantastic. Those two elements alone are enough to carry the game for many people, myself included. In fact, in parallel to Super Paper Mario, this third installment is also the one I most revisit within this series, despite not feeling that it is overall the best one. Here's why I don't think it's the best one. So, Bowser's Inside Story brought back the open world. For many players, that puts it above Partners in Time on principle right out of the gate. But as I said before, open worlds for their own sake are not necessarily a good thing, and I feel that this title did it very much for its own sake. Nothing interesting is done with the open world. It's open, but that's it. There was really no reason that it couldn't have been linear. The only time you ever backtrack within the story is when the bros escape from Bowser's body. And when you do that, they always just explore a totally different area of the region in question anyway. The biggest issue here, however, is that none of these regions are even remotely visually interesting. They're all very bland and very standard. A grassland, a forest, a mine, a beach. The giant plaque-filled teeth were interesting, but ultimately a pointless oddity that had no significance on gameplay or story. But here's the thing. I like interesting locations. There's no reason not to put them in these RPG spin-offs short of sheer laziness, but I can accept the vanilla fare if they have some sort of visual hook that indicates the antagonist's devastation of the environment. Problem is, Bowser's Inside Story is really lacking in that department. 
Fawful is wonderful. He's God's gift to Mario fans, but the only indication that he's bad news, other than the blorbs and the capture and imprisonment of Bowser's minions, which is admittedly very cool, is that he's scattered a handful of his minions around the overworld, as most enemies are just native creatures, and he took over Bowser and Peach's castles. And this is an interesting point. I think that the only two locations that are even remotely interesting to look at and explore in this game, at least in the overworld as opposed to inside Bowser's body, are those two castles. Why? Because they are the only locales which contain evidence of Fawful's occupation and devastation. Bowser's castle was converted into this fruity, over-the-top, Fawful-themed theater. Bowser's statues were covered in Fawful's swirly eyeglasses. His menacing foyer was converted into a concession hall. And last but certainly not least, his minions were all brainwashed into being Fawful fanboys. Peach's castle as well is in shambles. There are books laying everywhere, the carpets are all torn up, and of course the halls are being roamed and patrolled by Fawful's tech and minions. In the remake, he actually completes the remodeling to the point that it's basically not even Peach's castle anymore. It's simply Fawful's castle. But the rest of the overworld is Blansville. The music is beautiful, soothing even. The environments and colors are all quite pretty and pleasant, almost as if you're on vacation. Except the scenario they're trying to sell here is that Fawful is attempting to take over the Mushroom Kingdom, so why the hell is everything so chipper and peaceful looking? Even once he occupies Peach's castle, business at Toad Town just carries on as usual, uninterrupted. Maybe a few NPCs are vaguely concerned about it, but no more. The Blorb's disease is a problem, to be fair, but it seems rather disconnected from what's going on. Fawful is the one who spread it, but to what end? His grand master plan was simply to seize the Dark Star. No measly, pathetic toads were ever going to stand in the way of that, even in peak physical condition. So what really was the point of spreading the Blorbs? And then there's the journey itself. Here is where that linear partners in time locale visiting and scenario writing starts to look oh so good by comparison. Let me lay out the basic structure of the adventure in the previous title. Mario and Luigi, and the babies, arrive at a place. The shroobs are there also, doing some bad stuff that's affecting the locals. The heroes have to stop the shroobs in that area and find a piece of the Cobalt Star. So what we have here is the basic, you need to collect a MacGuffin, the bad guys are in your way, and also happen to be terrorizing innocents, you fight them on the way to your objective and become a big damn hero in the process. There are plenty more wrinkles, such as the whole fake peach debacle and the twists surrounding the Cobalt Star's true nature and purpose, to name just a couple, but you get the idea. Now here's how Bowser's entire portion of Bowser's Inside Story is structured. Bowser decides to travel to a location, usually one of the two castles. He hoofs it through completely irrelevant areas of the open world where nothing significant is happening to anybody, just the native beasts living out their daily, overly aggressive lives. Bowser reaches his destination, he has a boss battle. The story then contrives to launch or catapult him in some way to an extremely far off and equally uninteresting point on the map. He lands and decides to head to another location. He again hoofs it through some pleasant but bland scenery where nothing interesting is going on until he reaches his destination. Boss battle. Rinse and repeat. Bowser is so much fun to play as, but he isn't given anything fundamentally interesting to do outside of his boss fights, aside from the occasional very short-lived minion rescues. Bowser's Inside Story may be his game, but the way it's written, it's still just Mario and Luigi's adventure. I say this because their portion of the adventure, at least, has a somewhat interesting structure. First, they're stuck inside Bowser's body, which is host to some very novel locales with interesting visual designs and significant environmental interaction, making it significantly more fun and interesting to explore. They also know that Peach and some other Mushroom Kingdom residents are in there too. Thus, they search various parts of Bowser's body for the princess, only to find Toadsworth or Toadbert or whomever instead. They also stumble upon some problem in Bowser's body in the process and fix it in order to restore their arch nemesis's latent abilities. So even when they don't find Peach, something reasonably interesting and relevant happens. Eventually, though, they do find Peach, and she is promptly taken out of Bowser's body, prompting them to look for a way out, which, fun little twist, they find, and are then able to explore the same overworld as Bowser. Their quest then shifts into a search for Star Cures, a MacGuffin that will both cure the Blorbs and allow them entrance to Peach's castle to defeat Fawful. They accomplish this, but along the way, Bowser swallows the Dark Star, which ends up slowly absorbing his DNA and copying all his powers, a process which we see unfold gradually and menacingly until events reach their climax in the final boss with Dark Bowser and Fawful Soul. 
there. Now at least that's a quest I can get behind. In fact, once Mario and Luigi are in the outside world, traversing the bland locales is made slightly less tedious because they're going on smaller sub-adventures, searching high and low for a certain object, as opposed to Bowser, who is always just passing through. Look, I'm not asking for Bowser to be a hero. Far from it. I'm just asking for him to have more of a plan than reach my castle, beat up Fawful. Bowser is characterized well, and I don't think that he ever behaves inconsistently from previous iterations. But ultimately, he's just a tool for Mario and Luigi to sick on Fawful. And don't even get me started on those god-awful minigames. So in summation, my opinion on Bowser's inside story is as follows. It has an excellent premise, perhaps the strongest in the series. Its execution of that premise is unfortunately flawed, but I feel like they at least tried, and the premise itself is so freaking cool, and a solid handful of fun new characters were introduced, and Bowser himself is so much fun to play as, that at the end of the day we still have a very strong title that is a unique experience within the series, and certainly never loses sight of its roots, despite the generally poorer writing quality. I personally prefer the first two installments to this one overall, but I am an absolute sucker for playing as Bowser, so I still revisit this one the most frequently. And now we get into true downhill trajectory territory for both series. Let's hit Sticker Star first. What a mess. We all know this story. I'll start with what little credit is due. The one person on the development team with half a brain and the balls to stand up to Miyamoto remembered that Paper Mario does actually exist in a 3D world, and traditionally has turn-based battles with action commands. That's it. Everything else is a travesty that completely misses the point. It's an RPG with no experience points or statistical character growth whatsoever. Even Super Paper Mario had experience points and statistical character growth, and it was a 2D platformer. Furthermore, all your attacks are essentially reliant on items. Environments are your usual thematic fare, and the story is as bookendish as any of the core series platformers. So we have quirky dialogue with no substance or interesting context, causing it all to completely fall flat as your brain suffocates from the boredom and general lack of inspiration. There are no partners, Bowser is mute, no interesting new bad guy, Bowser is mute, no interestingly designed NPCs, as all have been replaced with generic paper toads, and oh yeah, Bowser is mute. He's not even mute in the platformers anymore. There's really nothing else to say here. So let's look at the final Mario and Luigi game before the crossover, Dream Team. I'm a little torn on this one. It's fun, I mean really, really fun, despite barely even trying with the scenario writing. I could not put this game down, despite not having a compelling reason to continue for most of the plot, because the battles were so much fun, and the dream world was so much fun, Dreamy Luigi is so much fun, and the soundtrack is positively orgasmic, and the visuals are gorgeous! But around the time I reached the penultimate area, Somnam Woods, I got burnt out. Eventually, the fun battles and dream world exploration was not enough to drive me forward when nothing interesting was happening in the story. Here's the breakdown. You're on Pilo Island, essentially the ruins of a sleep-themed civilization turned tourist trap. Points gained for not being the Mushroom Kingdom, and although many of the areas were fundamentally derivative, they still managed to have a very unique and novel aesthetic that made them a real treat to go through visually. Honestly, you could say the same of much of the Bean Bean Kingdom. But there's a new villain in town, Antasma, the King of Nightmares or something. Cool idea, great design, I really dug the Transylvanian accent, but we don't really see that much of him, and his ego is so underblown that he pretty much just up and willingly makes himself subservient to Bowser the minute he shows up on the island. So he's not as funny as Cacoletta and Fawful, nor as dangerous as the Shrews. He's kind of batting zero. He's first seen on the blimp Mario and Luigi arrive in for the tutorial battle, but his appearance here is a gaping plot hole because after this, his next appearance is in Dreams Deep, where he was apparently sealed away and sleeping until you encountered him at this point. This discrepancy is never explained. Anyway, his plan is pretty simple. Obtain a powerful MacGuffin called the Dreamstone that will allow him to shroud the world in darkness or whatever. He makes this plan apparent right away, there are no twists or change of goals at any point in the story, and he actually has no minions to call his own, despite being some alleged deity of darkness, so he relies on Bowser's army to get everything done. And that's pretty much the plot in a nutshell. Eventually, there's this terribly drawn-out fetch quest to assemble the parts for this super comfy bed, I shit you not, so that you can acquire the help of this other dream deity who ends up being a pretty funny character with what little screen time he has, but that's pretty much the only wrinkle. The rest is beat Bowser, save the world. 
and no, there is no devastation of the landscape. And while I enjoyed the characters of Private Goomb, Sergeant Guy, and Corporal Paraplonk in Bowser's Inside Story, and I appreciate that they have unique designs, it's always kind of bothered me that they get a promotion in Dream Team when not only were they mostly useless throughout the previous adventure, but outright betrayed Bowser with the rest of his minions. Why would he reward them with a promotion? At least their boss fight was really fun. Anyway, the Dream World is also a mixed bag. In my opinion, it's a little better than the 2D sections inside of Bowser from the previous installment because A, the environments are more fun to interact with, thanks to Luiginary abilities, B, the way battles work is altered and a very fun and empowering change of pace, and C, it comes in more frequent but bite-sized chunks, as opposed to the inside of Bowser sequences which tended to come less frequently but were more drawn out and a little less fun to begin with. The dream worlds themselves, however, were visually incredibly bland and uninspired. Honestly, just a cookie-cutter 2D version of the area you're currently in. The various areas of Bowser's innards were far more interesting to look at. And this is supposed to be the dream world. What better place to run wild with the world designs? I also find it worth noting that there was a fair amount of Superstar Saga fan service in this entry. There are Bean Bean Kingdom and Hoo Hoo Mountain tourists all over the island, there's a poster of Queen Bean in one of the towns, and we even see the return of Popple, another brilliantly written fan favorite from Superstar Saga. Unfortunately, Popple's presence here was completely squandered because of one major issue. For some fucking reason, he doesn't seem to recognize or remember the Mario Bros, and they don't seem to remember or recognize him. Why? This makes absolutely no sense. Popple is encountered about four or five times in Superstar Saga, and fought three of those times. Mario and Luigi were a real thorn in his side, and basically destroyed his thieving career in the Bean Bean Kingdom. You'd think he'd remember that. In fact, his boss fights in Superstar Saga literally end with him saying, I'll remember this. What happened, Popple? Did you pull a rookie on me and hit your head? The bros too have never seemed to forget old adversaries. None of the residents of Peach's Castle in Bowser's Inside Story had to be reintroduced to Fawful to know who he was, and Mario and Luigi immediately recognized the shrewbs in that really cool side quest in the same game. Furthermore, Fawful was shown in both Partners in Time and Bowser's Inside Story to remember the Mario Bros, so we know Beanish folk have fine memories. Why in blazes do Popple and the bros not remember each other at all in Dream Team? I love how they handled his boss fight, the fact that he's quote-unquote helping you fight Wiggler was a great and original touch, but his handling in the story was so bad it was distracting. In the end, Dream Team is either done in by the uninteresting scenario writing or the pace of progression. It has my favorite standard battle theme in the series, bar none, and it was by some miracle fun enough to keep me hooked for 30 or so hours, but the game is so bloated that I wasn't even at the end of it by then. So without a compelling story, the final two areas were a slog that literally took me months to get through, because I couldn't bring myself to play for more than like a couple of hours a week when I was craving a few battles. And finally, at long last, we arrive at Mario and Luigi Paper Jam, which is so repulsive to my sensibilities. Such a wasted opportunity that it prompted me to write all this. It's basically Dream Team, but they tried even less. I didn't even think that was possible, but they managed. First of all, they took the worst storytelling elements of Dream Team and Sticker Star, easily the two weakest entries in their respective series, and mashed them together and called it a game. The engine is all 100% Mario and Luigi, no Paper Mario mechanics, but given that series' trajectory, that's probably for the best. I also personally don't mind this because I slightly prefer the Mario and Luigi series over the Paper Mario series mechanically, but most players, and especially Paper Mario-leaning fans, were probably very put off by it. Anyway, no new characters are introduced in Paper Jam. Heck, lots of old characters are totally dropped. Toadsworth is here, but his Paper counterpart is as absent as Luigi's. Kami Koopa was pretty cool, but why acknowledge her existence when Kamek and Paper Kamek can call each other ugly? Paper Mario, at least up until Sticker Star, was known for its creative and original character designs even more than the Mario and Luigi series. The biggest tragedy of this game is that it should have been an opportunity for the developers to be their most creative in a long time, but instead they used it as an excuse to be their least creative ever. If I had to sum up this game in three words, it would be Paper Toad Hunts. Oh, so many Paper Toad Hunts. Hey guys, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a twist halfway through and all the regular guys got sucked into the paper world for a little while? Nope! All we need are more Paper Toad Hunts. The story is Bowser and Paper Bowser decide to team up when Luigi accidentally knocks over a magical book containing the world of Paper Mario. That's it. 
that that that's the story. There is a half-hearted homage to Paper Mario's between chapter intervals following the exploits of Peach and Paper Peach in their little cage, but it ultimately goes nowhere, so what was the point? All that happens in this game is Mario and company attempt to reach Bowser's castle, get some paper-themed obstacle thrown in their way, and have to do a bunch of paper toad hunts to enslave enough paper toads to create some giant cardboard doohickey, because no normal toads can lift the cardboard, I guess, to, to get you past the obstacle. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, more paper toad hunts. Oh, I forgot to mention why you need to hunt them down. You see, they're all very scared and bewildered at their new, very bland, yet pleasantly familiar surroundings, so they're scared of everything and run away from everyone. So you need to corral them like fucking cattle until they settle down enough for Mario to slap them and call them a bunch of melodramatic pansies, I guess. It's never adequately explained. It's just implied that they are somehow perpetually startled until you capture them. Environments? Blander than bland. If vanilla could be vanilla flavored, that would be the flavor. Plains, forest, beach, cave, desert, icy mountain, volcanic castle. No twist, no wrinkle. Oh wait, excuse me. Occasionally you'll find a big old cardboard cutout of the same locale you're in dropped on top of the locale you're in. I guess that's the visual devastation of the land. There's a bunch of life-size cardboard dioramas in place of the actual locations they represent. Great job, everyone. I'm shaking in my paper boots. To be fair, the Bowsers are capturing and enslaving some toads for a mining operation, so that's pretty evil and stuff, but... None of the free toads seem to be crying about it, so I guess it's not that devastating, huh? You know, another thing I find frustrating is that everything I wrote about the other games was leading up to my dissection of what makes this game so bad, but now that I'm here, there's so little substance that I'm already out of material. That's all there is to Paper Jam. So this is where my little rant originally ended, but fortunately we have since received a tiny ray of hope for potentially better scenario writing going forward from a very unexpected source. The bonus campaigns that apparently nobody but me liked from the Superstar Saga and Bowser's Inside Story remakes on 3DS. This video is already long enough as is though, so please join me next time as I take a look at Bowser's Minions and Bowser Jr.'s Journey to demonstrate how these lowly side games succeed where entries like Dream Team, Sticker Star, Paper Jam, and Color Splash fail. Spoiler alert, it's really not that subtle or complicated.